Good morning, Fellowship Church. Would you stand and worship with me, please? Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I was told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite, with all the better get it right. But it turns out you're the ones you were looking for all this time. Cause I'm just a, that's right. Put your hands together. Go ahead and greet your neighbor and tell them how good Jesus has been to you this week. Hallelujah 
Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. for raising a hallelujah this morning. The cloud. 
cloud by day is a sign that you are with me. The fire by night is a guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the into my Egypt you took me by the hand you marched me out in freedom into the promised land now I will not forget you I'll sing of all that you've done death swallowed up forever by the fury of your love you're the God who fights for me Lord of Lord, we thank you for leading us through these dark and troubled times. We thank you for leading out of all of our personal Egypts and that you are always there with us side by side, walking hand in hand as you walk us through the sea of troubles. Thank you, Lord. Good morning. I just got a bless our worship leaders this morning because our band was hit by that COVID thing. So there was some scrambling here at the end and grateful for you guys for stepping up and helping out. And I didn't think we'd still be using the word COVID at this point in time, but we are. So there it is. Um, that song we were just singing, you probably thought I don't recognize that one right away unless you listen to Christian radio. It's, it's a song called Egypt and it talks about deliverance, obviously. You know, one of the major themes throughout the Bible is that God was always sufficient, meaning whatever his people needed to get them from their current place to the place where God desired them to be, God was always sufficient. So you think about big kind of, I guess what we call meta story, you know, big picture story type things where you'd say, well, God was sufficient in getting his people Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Yeah, he, he did really, really big things to make sure that they would be brought from point A to point B and on from there. But God was also sufficient in a lot of small ways throughout the Bible. Meaning, a lot of people who just needed to get from here to there, and maybe it wasn't even physical, like Israel's trying to get out of Egypt and into Promised Land. For some people it was just, I want to leave this thing behind in my life. And then Jesus comes into their life. And there's this change in their life, and he shows them what what God is really like, regardless of what they thought until then. And he, he gets them from here to over there. God is always just, always enough. And I guess that's what sticks in my head when I hear the word sufficient, that God, biblically speaking, was always enough. Now, sometimes you might think that, wow, um, you know, wouldn't it have been really cool if God was like really lots and lots and lots when his people needed it? Well, sometimes God shows up in really big ways in this life, and sometimes God shows up, shows up in some pretty small ways in this life but he's always sufficient. Always just enough to get us through what we're currently dealing with and get us into the next place of blessedness. That's how God works. He's always sufficient. That's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says um, when he was dealing with that thorn in the flesh, your grace is always sufficient. And I'll bet Paul was thinking, you know, could you just like 
back up the dump truck of grace instead and just pour it out on me? Or no, 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 no. God says, I'm going to give you sufficient, which is just enough to get you through this day. And maybe that's something that we can land on as well, that God, you're always just enough to get us through this day. And maybe there's somebody right here now singing that song about victory. Maybe there's somebody here right now thinking, boy, I could use a victory in this part of my life right now because I'm tired of dealing with that thing right there. God says, well, I'll be sufficient for today. And I'll be back tomorrow. And I'll be back the day after that as well. And that's just a, night, it's a reminder of who God is and how he works. Um, friends, uh, as you've been, you know, maybe paying attention to the news this past week. You may have seen some things in the news about uh, what's happening in the country of Iran. Um, we support the ministry called Words of Hope. They do some incredible work over there. And John Oppenorth, our brother in Christ, has been sharing some things uh, via emails and so on. And uh, a lot of people are going through a very, very difficult time in Iran right now, including people who are maybe in some cases brand new followers of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite you to pray for them in these days, and certainly as you watch the news, but we'll pray for them now as well this morning, in addition to everything else we always pray for. So will you pray with me now, please? God, thanks for giving us a pause moment in what might already be a busy day. And we're grateful that you give us a few moments in our service that we can share with you what's on our heart. Um, God, we're... We're looking at the world that we live in today and we see so much that's painful and so much that looks broken. So much for which we'd say, well, God, would you step into that situation and do something? Every day we're reminded of what's happening in Ukraine with the war there. And we see what's happening in places like Iran and Syria and, and other places where believers, people who are trying to follow you, are, are just facing these incredible obstacles and sometimes even to the point of loss of life. And, well, God, we, we pray that you would do something about that. And we keep praying that again and again, that you would do something about that. And, Father, we're going to continue to pray that in faith, believing that somehow you're already doing things that we don't see, and maybe you'll do even greater things in the future. But we pray that, Father, for that war in Ukraine, that you would stop that war. We pray that for people in Iran and other places, Pacific Rim, places in Africa, where there's significant opposition to the faith, Father, we pray that that you would give them freedom and that you would protect your children. And Father, we pray that for ourselves and for our, the people living next door to us. And we don't have to look too far ourselves, God, to find some folks that are hurting in this world and facing opposition and, and maybe they're trying to do what's right or maybe even trying to serve you and they're just facing all these obstacles to it. And God, we pray that you would remove obstacles and that you would bless and Father, we're grateful this morning that we get to be here um, with our church family. And that's what it is. It's a family. Father, help us to never lose sight of that, that we're far more, far more than just a bunch of people who happen to gather at a geographic location on a Sunday morning instead. You call, uh, you call yourself Father, and you say to us that you have a family that exists in heaven and on earth. And it's all one family, and we're children of yours, and we are so grateful that you've reached into our lives and made us that because we wouldn't have dreamed of anything that big. Thanks for saving us through Jesus. And we are trusting in Jesus Christ for our salvation. And Jesus, we pray that more and more every day you would come to live in these bodies, and in these hearts, in these minds, and live out all your purposes and all your desires and help us to be everything you wanted us to be and help us not to be anything you didn't want us to be. We pray for that too. God, if there's anything in our lives altogether, or maybe anything in our life, just each one of us, that you want us to deal with today, not tomorrow, not someday, because we all do the someday thing, but if there's something in our life, some, some pushback against you, maybe some rebellion, maybe just a flat-out sin, if there's anything in our life that you want us to deal with today, God, may you place that upon our hearts and in our minds, and don't let us go. <laughs> just, just stay right there, oh God, and keep pointing on that. And may you give us strength more and more to be the people Jesus called us to be because this world needs us more than this world knows. Thank you, Father, for your spirit that you continue to pour out upon us. We pray for our church family and for all those who might need you in any special way. 
We all need you in a special way. But Father, I'm thinking of people who specifically need you for healing of any kind, whether it's something they've been dealing with for a long time or just some recent health struggles. Father, for people who have been hospitalized recently and maybe coming home or others still getting treatments there. Father, for people who've had some, some difficulties with relationships and some brokenness there. Maybe, Father, for somebody who's just struggling with their own internal sense of self and, and struggling with a sense of value and purpose. God, may you just meet us wherever the pain is in this life. And, and Father, we pray that you would heal and you would restore. You have this great vision, O oh God. It's called the kingdom, and we want to live into that where everyone, O oh God, would be so fully blessed by you and that everyone would be so so exactly where you want us to be. God, may that, may that be true for all of us. Thanks for loving all of us more than any of us will ever know. If we get nothing else out of our time together this morning, Father, may we just know that we're loved and that you have such a deep sense of compassion and care for each one of us. Father, we pray as well that as we, when we leave here in a while, that we take something very tangible with us, something that we can say, that, that's what God gave to me today, right there, that's it. God, give us something tangible to take with us so that maybe this coming week we, we live different, we think different, we feel different. Maybe we have a different perspective on some things in the world around us, whatever it might be, oh God. We pray that more and more you would just keep honing us and make us into the image of Jesus so that when we're out there in the world, people would know what we believe just by how we live and they'd know who we're following just by how we live. And we really, really, really want them to see Jesus through us. So we pray for that. And we're so grateful that you call us your children today. And thanks for loving all of us more than any of us will ever know. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, a couple of things just to remind you of that are, that are in the bulletins out there. And yeah, this, this, this little thing out there in the back, it's called a bulletin. Say it with me. Bulletin. Yeah, it's got all kinds of good information in there. So anyway, today is the last day that we'd be accepting ballots for the lay leadership positions that we have for elders and deacons. There's a table in the back. There's information about that on that same table. You'll find the child life collection. We're still doing that for another week if you want to make use of that as well. We're supporting that ministry that takes place in DeVos Hospital, so please be aware of that. We also have a discovery class coming up. A discovery class is a class that we hold Oh, a couple times a year usually just to share fellowship church with people who'd like to know more and there's a note in the bulletin for that as well but uh, we'd love to if you're interested in that please just contact the office so that we know that you're that you're planning on attending because we have food and I don't want you eating my cookie just so you know <laughs> friends I'll invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis this will be the easiest one that you'll have to find in this series there you go Follow along in your Bibles, whatever form you have the Bible in, or you can just listen as I read this. This is Genesis chapter 1. I told you this one would be easy to find. And it begins like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. Here's how it ends. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Friends, that's Genesis chapter 1 from our Bibles. It's a great account of what God was doing back in the creation days. These are our Bibles. God has given them to us, these words, so that they would be alive in this place and in every heart today as well. Amen. Please be seated. Well, friends, over the course of the past month, we've been working our way through a series 
That series is simply called Counter. We've been talking about what it means to be countercultural. If today is maybe a first day for you here, maybe that t term sounds a little bit unfamiliar. It simply means that we all live in a culture, that is, there's a way of life outside the doors of this building that we all become pretty accustomed to over time, and most of the time we don't even think about it. Well, Jesus calls us, and biblically we are called, to live in a way that at times is opposite from the culture or maybe even very different from the culture, we are to be counter-cultural. There are times when God, through his word, says, I know that's how the world does it, but here's how I want you to do it. So we use the little image of the, all the fish swimming in one direction and that lonely little yellow fish swimming in that direction. Sometimes when we're trying to live out the Christian faith, we find ourselves living in a way that's very different from the world around us. And in some of the previous weeks, we talked about what it means to live a life of serving. That means looking at others and wanting to place them ahead of ourselves, very selfless serving. We talked about love. We use that word agape, and we're going to come back to that word a little bit this morning. That's why we covered it before today, because agape is selfless, sacrificial, always put the other one first kind of love. And we talked a little bit about what it means last week to have a calendar that honors God, because we use that word Sabbath and for some of you, that word might have been familiar, and for others, maybe not so familiar. But we talked about what it means to have um, time in our calendars that's literally carved out for some very specific and intentional faith practices. That must have raised a few questions last week, because I always kind of evaluate a message based on how many emails or texts I get the following week. And a number of folks this past week texted me or sent me an email or something and said, so, so does the Sabbath always have to be on Sunday? And I responded and said, when else would you have the privilege of seeing me? Or something like that. No, I'm kidding, but you get the end. I said, well, no. I mean, for some people, that, that doesn't fit work schedules and all that, everything else. But here's what I know. You can evaluate a person's spiritual maturity by whether or not they have faith practices built into their calendar. Because this, this doesn't happen without some sense of intentionality to it. So if there's no intention, then at some point in time it becomes that, well, that's that faith, that's that thing I do if I can find a spot on my calendar which never happens because someday never comes. So yeah, I, I, I believe with all my heart that Sabbath, whether or not it takes place on a Sunday or maybe some other time during the week, if it doesn't happen, it becomes really, really difficult to live an intentional life of faith with family, friends out there and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's Sabbath. So this morning we're going to discuss something that um, we're going to run out of time on. So I'm going to summarize a bit. We'll, we'll try to talk this through a bit. But frankly, at the end of our time this morning, you're probably going to have more questions than answers because this morning we're talking about gender and sexuality. Well, that got kind of quiet, didn't it? Okay. <laughs> Because already you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Mike, there's young ears in here. Are we doing the PG version? Yes, we're doing the PG version today. Absolutely. Somebody right now is thinking, hey, Pastor Mike likes to show videos. You got a video for that one, Pastor Mike? No, I don't. We're not doing a video today. All right. Um, you might also be thinking, is, is that something that we ought to be talking about in church? Well, I, I don't know where else we should be talking about it in a place that would be more constructive for us to discuss it. Because here's something I know. You live in a culture today that is absolutely hypersexed. If you don't believe me, just kind of take note today of all the stuff that you might see on television. And just note how much of it has something to do with gender and sexuality. We live in a world that is incredibly hypersexed. And the world that we live in is not all that different from the world that Jesus was in. So we're going to draw some connections in a few minutes and talk about some things. Um, if I ask you how it is today that advertisers market their products, you'd say, well, Pastor Mike, regardless of whether they're using TV or radio or online stuff or flyers or something, they're, they're always trying to get my attention. Well, let me tell you something. A few minutes ago, when I said we were going to discuss gender and sexuality, I had your undivided attention for all of about a microsecond, didn't I? Like the okay, where are we going with this? Because it gets people's attention. And this world that we live in is absolutely, incredibly hypersexed. 
Um, for a number of years, I've been serving on what's called the Sex Ed Advisory Board for the local school district. Why they chose me, I have absolutely no idea, but there it is, right? If you think you're swimming in it, you ought to see what our high school age kids are swimming in these days. It, 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 it shocks me at times to sit there and talk about the kind of curriculum that we can use and, and the things that kids are facing and, and all the difficulties that they have in this world because of the mixed messages they're getting from both from family and then from outside family. We live in a world in which you just can't avoid it. And here's the deal. The world that Jesus was in, the world of both New Testament and Old Testament, were also worlds in which it was very, very difficult to live without being swallowed up by their understanding of gender and sexuality. Now, um, because we've only got about, I don't know, 20 or 25 minutes or three hours or something like that this morning, we're going to run out of time on this, okay? So that's why I say you're probably going to walk out of here with more questions than answers. At some point in time, you're going to be thinking, yeah, but Pastor Mike, what do you really believe about this? And you're going to have a specific issue in mind. And it's probably going to be attached to a letter or a title. Yeah, Pastor Mike, that title right there that I heard used this past week, used to describe a person, what do you think about that? Or Pastor Mike, would you marry somebody involved in this or something like that? Well, I can't answer every question. So we're going to paint with some fairly broad brush strokes. What I want to do this morning is give you kind of a, a bit of a context as to why the Bible teaches what it teaches. And then we're going to hit a number of biblical passages that talk about why God designed what God designed. And then if you want to send me 500 emails this week, you can send them to me, okay? And I'll get to them in the next century or whenever, some point in time. But, but today we're going to go kind of broad-based here because this issue of, of sexuality in the world that we live in and the gender issues in the world we live in is so, is so involved that it's impossible for us to cover all of the details. So maybe we'll take an entire month of Sundays at some point in time in the future and cover it. But I want to give you a couple of words to focus on first this morning. Here's the first thing I want you to think about. I want you to think about a Greek versus a Hebrew worldview. Right now at least one person is disappointed because they thought we were going to talk about sex instead. No, we're going to talk about the Greek versus the Hebrew worldview. Now you all have a worldview, whether you know it or not. You have that kind of built into you, you have a way of seeing the world around you. You have a way of participating in this culture, and you make choices about the parts of the culture that you don't want to participate in. You have your do and don't list that's built into your mind. You have a worldview, a way of seeing the world. That word itself, worldview, is actually kind of a newer word in our, in our lingo. It kind of came up in the 70s and the 80s with the moral majority and those kinds of things. And the teaching through organizations like Focus on the Family, they, they kind of hammered on that word. But today, you all have a worldview whether you recognize it or not. But here's what you should know. And this was very true of biblical days as well. There are at least two dominant ways of viewing the world that we live in. You either view the world through Greek eyes or you view the world through Hebrew eyes. Let me tell you the difference between the two. In the Greek world, which is the world that Jesus was living in, and I would even say it was the world of the Old Testament, even though the Grecian Empire didn't exist in those days, they still had that same mindset. There was a separation between what I believe about God and how I live. And we'll dig into that in a second. But in the Greek world, it was the yeah, I'm not a complete atheist. I have some beliefs about some kind of divine being and what that divine being might be doing in this world and in my life, but that divine being really doesn't care how I live. I mean, that divine being, God, small g, big g, whatever, has better things to do than worry about what I did last night. So that's kind of the, the Greek view. Get to that in a second. The Hebrew view pulled everything together to say, in effect, we believe that there's a God. We believe that that God is creator. We believe that that God does care about us and he cares about the particulars and the individuality and all that kind of stuff and that God influences my life today. So there's the two kind of different worldviews there. I'm going to flesh that out a second. I want to introduce you to three guys that you'll never meet in person. Their names are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Yeah, that's not Plato the clay stuff that the kids play with. That's Plato, a man named Plato, okay? Um, you're probably not familiar with those guys and their writings. Maybe you are but you certainly know some things about the things that they taught. Because Socrates, all four, all three of them lived about 400 years before Jesus was born. So you're probably already thinking, then why talk about him today? 
Well, because they developed a school of thought that people called the Grecian mindset or the Greek worldview. There was Socrates, he had a student named Plato, Plato became a teacher, Plato eventually had a student named Aristotle, and there they are. They taught, they were kind of the primary teachers of this thing called the Greek worldview. Now, they were religious people in a sense in which they believed that there was a God out there or a whole bunch of other gods. But Socrates and Plato and Aristotle were really big on this idea of what today we would call dualism. That's my last word there. Dualism. There it is. They were really big on this idea called dualism. Dualism simply says that um, you have a body, and that body's a nice thing to have, but that body's like a concession, and no God ever really wanted you to have it. God's really only interested in your soul. You are a living soul. This is what Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato taught, and a whole bunch of people after them followed along in that teaching, but they were the beginning of it. You're really just your soul. And right now, you're having like this bodily existence on this planet, but this is not who you really are. I mean, this is just like a short period of time for you because your soul is absolutely immortal. That's what they believe. Your soul has always been alive and will always be alive, and you keep going from one place to another to another with this soul, cosmic existence, and right now, you're spending, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years on this planet. And because you're on this planet, your soul has that body, and that body really isn't all that nice of a thing to have because it breaks down and it's got all these illnesses and diseases. They could see that in their world. They had no way of curing them. So they said, yeah, this body, nobody really wants that after all anyway. Well, if that's what you believe, that you're really just a soul and you've got this body out here that nobody really cares about anyway, well, you might as well just use that body for whatever you want, right? I mean, you can connect those dots, can't you? Are you following me just a little bit here? If, if you're really just your soul, and this body is just kind of yours temporarily, what difference does it make how you use the body? You can do whatever you want to do with it. Because God, big G or small g, doesn't care. That God, whatever you believe in, is really just interested in what's in here, and what you do out here doesn't matter. Well, if that's the case, then I might as well take this body seven days a week and do whatever I want to do with it because I might as well just focus on whatever brings me pleasure and whatever brings me fun and whatever puts a smile on my face. So in the days of Aristotle and Socrates and, and Plato and all of that, they got involved in all kinds of practices that would absolutely raise the hair on the back of your neck if we talked about them this morning. Like awful stuff, gender, sexuality type stuff. And it was public. You could see it on your way to work in the morning if you just walked down the wrong path because they had absolutely no sense of morality or privacy to it. And by the way, the number of people involved in it and the gender of the people involved in it, well, that didn't matter either, right? Because there are no barriers. It's just whatever works for you because God doesn't care about this body. That's the Greek view of the world. So in Jesus' day, when Jesus was on earth, he was dealing with that stuff. And if you read your New Testament and some of the passages in the New Testament about your body, we're going to cover a couple of them, you can see kind of behind the scenes what they were dealing with. As they're writing this stuff out in Scripture, they're probably looking out the window going, well, that ain't it. That's not what God wanted to see. Because that's the world that they had. It was absolutely pornographic, in public, acted out before you. If you went to a play in Jesus' day, because they didn't have Netflix yet, if you went to a play in Jesus' day, there's a really, really good chance that you were going to see something acted out on that stage that today we would say, well, that's NC-17 or X, flat out. And, and that was their world. And they saw no problem with it. Why? Well, because the body doesn't matter. Only your soul matters. Now, it'd be really difficult to understand issues of gender and sexuality today if you don't start there. Because here's what I know. The world that we live in is still thinking that way about your body, which is the God only cares about your soul. God only cares about who you are in here. What you do out here Sunday through Saturday really doesn't matter. And it's simply a concession that God gives to us, like the, well, as long as you're going to be on that planet, you might as well try to have a little bit of fun, and I'll see you when you finally get off that planet, and we'll find a better existence for you or something. 
That's what their world believed. And in some cases, I think that's what our world believes today. So now I want to take you back into some scripture passages and show you, again, broad brush strokes. We can't cover all the details here, but share with you at least a couple of things that you'll find in the Bible about that topic. Here's something that we found in Genesis 1. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, so they're both in the image. And then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. And we just kind of leave it out there from there. I want you to notice that when God created, you notice it says God created man, but it also says God created male and female. So God is already doing spe something special there. And God says, I created them in the image of myself, in the image of God, meaning that there's something about us, something about you, and something about me that is literally today of God. I, I don't know what else to say about that. I don't want to say, well, because I'm in the image of God, I'm somehow therefore God, because that's not true. But God took something of himself and put it in me and in you. And therefore today, you are somehow in the image. So don't you ever think of yourself less than that, because you're already there. And then you'll notice it says that God created man, that's kind of humankind, and God created male and female. I've got a couple of Hebrew words for you today. You knew we'd have Hebrew words today, right? Okay, here's the first one. Ish, just say it with me. Ish, that's the easiest Hebrew word you'll ever get other than amen, right? Say it with me again, please. Ish, now say the other word. Isha, Isha. Those are the Hebrew words for male and female. Ish is male, Isha is female. Ish means um, like foundation, something that's solid. Isha means something um, solid, but it has a breath to it. The ah at the end of it means that you're breathing into it. And remember, biblically speaking, breath is always a sign of life. So here's what God did. God creates male, which is foundation. And then God adds female to it, which brings life to it. You follow me? So already, in Genesis 1, God says, I'm creating foundation with life. And here's the thing. If you take one away from the other, you're missing something there. So God's already designed something in Genesis 1 that already fits together and works together. There's foundation and there's life. So when somebody comes up with the attitude of the, well, God doesn't care what you do with your body and God doesn't care about the gender thing, I would say, well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, which is before the fall, by the way, get to that in 30 seconds, God has already defined something and designed something that works together and they bring life to each other. Now let's talk about that fall thing. There certainly are people today who would say that, well, um, issues of gender and sexuality are simply kind of a concession of God. God never wanted to make a big deal out of that, just kind of the, well, if you got to do it, you got to do it. Like Adam bargaining with God saying, well, can't I have a little bit of fun on earth? Oh, just go ahead and here's the gender sex thing for you. No, no. That was all before fall. That was before sin. That was when God was defining everything yet and designing. This was part of the original creation in which everything was just the way God wanted it to be. And here's the really good part. At the very end of what we read today, it said this. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. If you're familiar with Genesis 1, which is the part of the Bible where it talks about all of creation, on the first day God made this and this and this, on the second day God made this and this and this. At the end of every little paragraph there, it said God saw all that he had made, and God saw that it was good. So when God's hanging stars in space, and when God's creating the Milky Way, and God's creating mountains and planets and all this stuff, Everything that God creates, right down to the hippopotamus, it says that God saw all that he had made, and it was good. And then on the sixth day, when God created you, look what the Bible says about that. God saw all that he had made, and God saw that it was very good, which is different than good, right? You were expecting, if you didn't know that passage of the Bible, that God would create all, God would create all of us and then say, eh, that's good. Or, ah, they're not bad. We'll see what the next world brings or something like that. That's not what it says. When God created us in his image, genders, male, female, when God created us, God said, oh, now that's very good. 
God, you mean to tell me that when you were creating solar systems, you said they were good, but when you created me, you said it was very good? Don't you ever look in the mirror and think less of yourself than God does? And don't ever look at people and think less of them than God does. Because during all of the previous five days of creation, God saw what he had created and said, that's good. And the angels all together must have said, God said that it was good. And then God creates us. Flesh and bone, soul and spirit, body, all of that. And God says, oh, now that's very good in my sight. That ought to change the way that you think about yourself. And it ought to change the way that you think about other people. It really ought to change the way that you think about issues of gender and sexuality. Because that was all part of what God said, this is very good. This is not some concession where God said, oh, just go ahead and do that thing. No, no, no. This was all part of what God had designed from the very beginning. Now let me go deeper into this with you. The next passage, 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That would have been so foreign to their world when the Apostle Paul wrote this to a bunch of people in Corinth who were trying to be Christian in some sense of that world but didn't know what it meant yet, for them to believe that any kind of a God, whether it's small g or big g, for them to believe that any kind of God would actually want to live in these bodies? Don't you remember what Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato said about these bodies? Plato once said that the body is just the tomb of the soul meaning get rid of this thing as fast as you can. In Plato's day, there was actually a suicide cult in which they were taking their own life just to get away from this body and move on to the next phase. And now you mean to tell me that God looks at these bodies and says, that's my home? That's my dwelling place? Of all the places on earth where I could build a temple, of all the places in the galaxies where I could have my dwelling place, I choose to live in you? Have you ever seen a picture or driven past a really, really cool looking church building and thought to yourself, wow, it's cool that God gets to live there. Years ago, I had a, we did a worship service. I was on a trip, did a worship service in what they then called the Crystal Cathedral. Have you ever seen the Crystal Cathedral? Yeah. Have you ever watched television? Yeah, of course you've seen the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah, yeah, Bob Schuler and all that. I mean, that place was so, man, when the sun came up over the mountains, it was so stunningly beautiful. God looks at that building and looks at you and said, I'd take you. Now, that must have just, for the world that they were living in in those days, the idea that these bodies mattered that much must have just triggered something in their head. I, I, I can't even fathom that. But God says, I'd rather live in you than anywhere. You're my temple. Now look at that last verse there. See what it says? Therefore what? Honor God with your body. Honor means it's like a, it's like a thing of worship. It, it's like a, when you honor someone, you place them above yourself. It's like exalting somebody higher. It's why when you walk into a courtroom, the judge is always sitting at a chair higher than yours. To the point where I'd say, hey, can I sit up there with you? That's a really good vantage point, right? No, no, no. Only the judge sits up there. That's why we call him what? Your honor. Or call her your honor. Because it's a position of honor. So when you push someone higher, you're saying, I'm honoring you. I had a wedding yesterday, and as they're doing their rings together, they always say, with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. Then they put that ring on each other's finger. Saying, okay, you, you got this, right? That ring is a sign of the fact that you are always pushing that person higher than you. So you'll know you're getting it when you're having a little contest to see who can push the other person higher. That's what it means to honor. Love that thought. Well, look what that verse says. You mean to tell me that I can now take this body that Plato said was a complete waste, just get rid of it, and Aristotle said it's a joke. You mean now I can take this body and somehow in the way that I live, I'm worshiping God with it? Yeah, that's how serious God takes this. God takes this incredibly seriously. 
That God looks at us and says, the way that you live in that body matters to me, and I even see your life in that physical body as worship to me. This is not just worship. When we honor God with our body every day, that becomes worship, which was completely foreign to their way of thinking. It really doesn't fit the way that we think today anymore either, right? Right about now, you're probably thinking, yeah, Pastor Micah, I've got some titles in my mind, some words that we use to describe people. I have some letters in my mind that we use to describe people as well. And boy, I sure hope this world gets it right at some point in time, you know. Did you know that pornography has a higher revenue every year in the U.S. than all four of the major sports leagues combined? Baseball, football, basketball, and hockey. All four of the major sport leagues take all of their revenue, combine it, and pornography generates more income, more revenue every year than all four of those combined. Here's the other piece of that. There's very little difference between the difference in pornography consumption among Christians and non-Christians. So just about the time that we might say, hey, Pastor Mike, preach that thing. Say, well, hang on a minute here. We've got a problem too. In fact, th this problem is a whole lot bigger than just a few acronyms or a few titles that we apply to people. Because again, when we live in a hyper-sexed world, it's so easy to get caught up in small pieces of that. Here's what I know, is God says, I designed this life and this body to work in such a way that even the way that you live in that physical body, it's worship to me. There it is. You've been waiting for this for a couple of minutes. Let me just draw the line here without being able to share a lot of scripture passages this morning. I believe the Bible is very, very clear in teaching that God designed these physical bodies and our relationships to be confined within the bounds of monogamous heterosexuality. That is, one man, one woman committed relationship. Monogamous heterosexuality, it's very clear. And anything outside of that becomes a means of dishonoring God, including that pornography thing I just shared. So here's what I know. God had a very different intention for these lives than the message you're going to get from the world around us. And if there's one way that you and I can live counterculturally, it certainly would be in the way that we understand gender and sexuality issues. Now I've got to share one more thing with you. This comes out of the book of Ephesians. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a radiant church. You see the word love there? You already know there's a number of words in the Greek language that we translate to our word love. I'll bet you already know which one that is. It's the word agape. Because whenever we talk about Christ loving the church, of course it's going to be agape. Agape is a very selfless, sacrificial, all-encompassing love. It's a love that knows no bounds. It's the love that God shows for us in giving Christ to us. And then the Bible takes that same word and uses it to describe the relationship between a man and a woman and that God intends that relationship to be something that's literally like a radiant church. Do you see how seriously God takes this? This isn't one of those, well, if you don't mind and it's not too much of a hassle and you don't feel like you're giving up too much, you might try to do it this way. No, God said the relationship between Christ and the church where Jesus died for the church and that kind of a relationship, I want to see that in the relationship between men and women. That's how seriously God takes this. And of course, it's all about the love they share between each other. Now, as, as soon as I've, you know, we've shared all of this today, and you probably have a lot more questions and answers, and you're thinking, yeah, but Pastor Mike, what about this and what about that? I'm always interested in having conversations about gender and sexuality with one great big provision up front. Are we going to treat people the way Jesus did? Because here's what I know. Jesus never compromised truth. He was always full of grace and truth. He never compromised truth. But he always led with this incredible measure of grace. Not long ago, I reread the story of Zacchaeus. And the funny thing about the Bible is, you can read a story 50 times, and when you read it for the 51st time, you think, why didn't I see that before? And in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, so why did Zacchaeus come down the tree? That cute little fella climbed out. Why? 
Why did he even bother? Was it because Jesus had some incredible message about greed that Zacchaeus was just drawn to? No. No, he was drawn to love. People are drawn to love. Here's why the world doesn't care what you think today. Because we don't always lead with love. Really. The world that we live in, when it comes to issues about gender and sexuality, more often than not, they don't care what the church thinks. Why? Well, because we haven't always led with love all that well. I have this belief that if we lead with love, and if we do it the way that Jesus did it, Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. I have this belief that if we do it the way Jesus did it, they just might sit up and take note. Because we love them too much to see them compromise the bodies that God gave to them. This is not a tomb of the soul. It's part of who we are. and It's what God designed. And God says, I like that body. I even call it very good. I like everything about it. So I wonder if maybe the reason why sometimes the world just considers us to be, I don't know, a bunch of old prudes or something, I guess, is because we don't always lead with love. And if we could just do this the way that Jesus did it, because he didn't compromise truth with anybody, if we could just do it the way Jesus did it, maybe the world would see the message that we live out and the message that we send differently than they, well, those are the people who just have that long list of do's and don'ts. It's not what Jesus was. It's not what I want to be either. Because the God who created us, created us to be very good, had a plan for us from the beginning, brings together male and female in a relationship that none of us would ever fully understand. If you get it, you're smarter than I am. I know that. And then God says, this is part of my plan. And I want to see you live this out in a way in which the way that you function in that body literally worships me. And so often I think not only outside the church, but inside the church as well. When it comes to issues like gender and sexuality, we don't get that at all. But it's what God designed. God designed you to be very good in every part of you. And it's what he still wants to see in your body and in your life today. And in your relationships, of course, with members of the opposite gender. That's what God says, that's what I wanted to see in you. I wanted to know that for you it was literally like Christ in the church. That's a beautiful thing. God has high hopes. Not just high hopes for all of us, but he has high hopes for you too. I wonder if, if when we think of gender and sexuality, if we take our cues from the world outside of us, which is an easy thing to do, or if we really have an understanding of God, how God designed this to work, and what would it look like for us to live that out with agape love this week? Will you pray with me, please? God, thank you for, for your word even when it stands so much in contrast to the world around us. So easy, oh God, to, to read your word and see, well, this is what God designed, and look at the world around us and say, well, I can't even begin to see a connection between the two. It looks so different. And God, one of the ways that in the culture that we live in, that we've wandered so far away from any sense of biblical truth, is certainly with gender and sexuality, Father, we pray that you would um, teach us your ways and guide us in your paths. That's what David prayed. But God, as we try to live that out, that you would give us this incredible sense of grace and love for the world around us so that, so that we never become um, judging people. We love them too much for that, oh God. We pray as well that our body of Christ here, this family, would always be a welcoming and affirming and loving place to be, even if sometimes we stand on some pretty hard truths. But we accept people here. We love them. God, we pray that for us, if there's any place in our lives individually where we're falling way short of this, may you speak to us very clearly today. Speak to us clearly. Thanks for loving us when we get it right. Thanks for loving us when we get it wrong. Father, thanks for planting seeds Thanks for calling us very good. Thanks for designing these bodies as, as something that would bring you honor rather than just a, oh, go ahead and 
do whatever you want to do. And this week, may these bodies and the way that we live, particularly with the issues of gender and sexuality, Father, the way that we live, may it be honoring to you and pleasing to you. That's our prayer. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and worship with me one more time? Father of kindness, you have poured our grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Yes 
is our yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. I believe God makes lots of promises to us throughout this life. And I believe there's this promise of God inherent in his word about how we handle matters of gender and sexuality. And God says, when you do it the way I've designed it, there's this blessing that comes with it. And sometimes that'll be very different from the world around us. That's what we call living countercultural. But it's where the blessing lies. And of course, when we see the world around us, we see, wow, God, there's so much of it that doesn't line up with that. I know, I know. But God says, I want you to approach that with agape love. Because they'll be drawn to the love far quicker than they'll be drawn to, to some doctrine that you've memorized. May that be true for all of us this week. Friends, if you're a guest here this morning, there are some gift bags in the back in the coffee area. Please take one with you. We're really glad to have you here. If you'd like somebody to pray over you this morning before you leave, there are some awesome elders. They'd love to meet with you down here and pray over anything that's going on in your life. Please remember all the things that are taking place in the life of the church in the lobby. Love to have you be a part of that. Friends, as you leave this place today, may you take with you God's grace and his mercy and his peace. May it be poured out upon you in abundance this week. Go in peace. Amen.